Okay, so let us now prove that analytical inversion formula. And as I already said, um, at the heart of the proof will be a representation formula for the Hunkel function, um, which I'm not proving. It's this one over here. So H0 of K times the square root of S squared plus T squared is one over pi integral over R e to the I absolute value of T A of sigma plus S times sigma, sigma times one over A of sigma D sigma. And uh, the, the, the references get older and older. Um, I think the best proof is in uh, Mohs and Feschbach, Methods of Mathematical Physics, unfortunately. Uh, um, that's in page 800 on, on page 823, I think in the edition from 1955. Um, so um, yeah, it gets older, but it's correct. So uh, I can change it. Okay, so I'm going to use that. And if you look at it very closely, then it looks a little bit like the representation theorem, which we already proved for the Bessel function of the first kind. And it turns out that it's in a, an extended way, like over here, and using a very similar um, proof. Um, it can also be extended for Bessel functions of the second kind. Okay, so. Um, that simplifies our inversion formula. And uh, this is what we already had. So what we measure is, uh, so why is that a sigma over here? I'm sorry, so that should be an S. Okay, uh, our measurements, G of theta and S are in fact an RQ of theta and s, and uh, that was defined up there as k square over i over, um, over k square i over four integral over s one, and that's where uh, the support of our q over here, which we're trying to recover is h zero of k times norm l times theta plus s times theta perp. That's where we can actually measure minus y, um, and that's the, uh, the place where we take the measurement, excuse me. That's the place where we take the measurement. Minus y, uh, q of y e to the i k x times, uh, i to the i k theta times y dy. Again, this is the incoming wave. This is what we're trying to, uh, to, um, to find out. And this is h0, and this over here is the point where we are actually taking the measurement. Okay, uh, now um, L times theta plus S times theta minus Y, uh, norm of that, that can be written, well, Y is of the form theta times Y times theta plus theta times theta perp times theta perp. So taking uh, the norm of that amounts to taking uh, the square root of L minus theta times Y squared plus S minus Y times theta perp squared. So um, yeah, this is now exactly of the form over here. And I can plug in my formula. And this is nothing but k squared i over, uh, k squared i over four, there's a one over pi here, integral over s1, integral over r e to the, well, absolute value of the first one. So absolute value of l minus theta times y. A of sigma plus i times s minus y times theta perp times sigma. That's just plugging in this one over here. And uh, then uh, taking, I already take the d sigma to the end. And then we have over here the one over a of sigma. We have the q of y and we have the incoming wave e to the i k theta times y. Okay, now uh, we observe that um, since uh, y is uh, in the inside the unit uh, on the un in the unit ball, uh, and theta of course is as well, we have that y times theta, the absolute value of that norm of that. No, it's the absolute value of course, scalar product. I'm sorry, scalar product of y times theta is of course smaller than smaller or equal to one. 
And of course, we were measuring before or after the um, the object. And for simplicity, for simplicity, I will assume that L is larger than uh, zero at this point. So we are measuring the transmitted value. Then we have uh, that L minus Y times theta, well, L is larger than Y times theta since the absolute value of this is smaller than one. So this is nothing but L minus Y times theta. And uh, what happens if L is smaller than, than zero? Well, of course, then it's minus L plus Y times theta. Then it, this one has always the sign of L. And uh, I, I would just uh, get um, a minus A of sigma up here. So um, that's exactly uh, why I defined it in, in this way. So um, I've, I forget about this, right? I mean, uh, exactly the same thing uh, is true for uh, L smaller than zero. Okay, so uh, using that, we have that this is a k squared i times 4 over pi, and I change the order of integration. So I take the integral over r to the front, and I already collect everything that depends on sigma only. So this is a 1 over a of sigma over here. There is, uh, I cannot forget about the absolute value over here. So this is something like e to the i times a of sigma, uh, i times a, i times l times a of sigma. And I take that to the front as well. And over here we have an e to the i times s times sigma. Uh, that depends uh, on sigma only again. So I take that to the front as well. Now what's left is an integral over S1, e to the minus i times, uh, now let's look, there is a theta times y over here, theta times a of sigma times uh, y over here. So I have, um, when I take the y over here out, then I have an a of sigma times theta, that's this one over here. I have a k times theta, but it, because I have a minus sign over here, that goes into the bracket as a minus sign, so minus k times theta. This is the first term. And what is now left is this one over here. So this becomes something like a theta perp times sigma. So this is sigma times theta perp times y, q of y dy d sigma. Oops. Okay, so that's it. And uh, I claim that we're more or less done. Why? Now, let's look at this one over here. The support of Q is in S1. So if I extend this to, um, to um, an integration over all of Rn, that doesn't change, right? So I can take this as an integral over Rn. But then let's, let's look at what we have here. We have something like e to the minus a something times y, Q of y dy. That's the Fourier transform. Okay, that's the Fourier transform of Q that we have here. So this is nothing but the Fourier transform of Q uh, evaluated at the point A of sigma minus K times theta plus sigma times theta perp, and uh, then uh, multiplied by 2 pi because we are missing the prefactor of the Fourier transform up here. Okay, that's great, right? So all this boils down to just a Fourier transform. And now let's look at the whole thing over here. Now we have an e to the i s sigma up here. The rest here does not depend on s. That's the only place where this one depends on s. Okay, so we can interpret this integral over here as the inverse Fourier transform, because there's a plus sign over here, of the rest evaluated at the point s. So it's the inverse Fourier transform of everything that's over here. So one over a of sigma e to the i l times a of sigma times q hat of a of sigma minus k times theta plus sigma sigma times theta perp um, evaluated at s. And of course we have the two pi. We already had that. And now we're missing a square root of two pi for the one dimensional Fourier transform here. So uh, we need to plug that in as well. Okay, so we have that RQ is equal to the inverse Fourier transform of that thing over here, evaluated at S. So, uh, of course, what, we do, what do we do? We take the Fourier transform uh, at both sides. So, the, with respect to the second variable, 
So this left, left hand side now becomes R Q hat of theta and sigma. And uh, on the right hand side, well, the inverse Fourier transform goes away. And all we have now left is i k squared square root of uh, pi over two. Um, that's this one over here, i k squared. And we have a square root of pi left. And uh, in the denominator, we have uh, for um, the, um, the two goes away, the square root of two goes away. So there's a square root of two left down here. We have a one over a of sigma e to the i times a of sigma uh, i to the a i l a of sigma q hat of a of sigma minus k times theta plus sigma times theta. Okay, and that's exactly what we wanted to prove. Um, now, um, two things. First thing is there is an analytic inversion formula. That's very interesting. And uh, the second thing, it's not really accessible, right? So what does this actually mean? And that's what we're going to talk about next. <laughs>